right, so one of the things that is really uh, works well for me and that I really enjoy is when we're going through a book of the Bible, it's actually really easy for me to know what I'm going to have to work on. And because uh, normally when you're working uh, more topically, you're going to a lot of places to get sources in the Bible and try to figure out how you're going to deal with that. In this, cha- in this case, it's going through Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians. You could just kind of hit it. But if you were here last week, you know that we skipped a part. And there were people who say, yeah, I know why you skipped it. So we didn't skip it permanently. We skipped it because the parts of the uh, two chapters were tied together and we're backing up to go to that. And uh, just as, as you might have heard next week, Matt Carter will be here. And uh, if you've never heard Matt speak, uh, I w- I'm going to leave all the really, really, really difficult parts for him <laughs> to deal with. Actually, I know you should laugh because I called him and I told him that. And then I said, I'm just kidding. And uh, but he will be here. And just to let you know, guys, if you haven't Uh, signed up or you're still wondering should I go to the men's retreat that he will be here speaking Friday night and Saturday even if you don't know you part of it you know it's worth going Matt will be uh, will do a great job you will enjoy uh, spending this time with him Um, but we're going to talk about one of those difficult parts and it was difficult in their day and if you're like a lot of people you say good Paul addresses it issue solved we never have to struggle with it again wrong (laughs) in fact it let me tell you why it, it works that way. Because cultures constantly change. Because people are still asking questions, trying to figure things out. Uh, because even in the church, in who we are, we are still, I put it in your title, we are still, what part do you think I was talking about? We are still what? Messed up. We are. <laughs> and God has a plan in that. He has a purpose in that. In fact, it's one of those places that people really get thrown off because they say, the reason I'm not a Christian, the reason I don't believe in Jesus, the reason I don't follow God is because of the church, right? They're hypocrites. You know, they they do things they're not supposed to do, yes. Um, They don't do everything the right way, right. They're not holy and righteous, yes, absolutely. And just to go ahead and tell you, it's always been that way. It was that way in Paul's day, it is that way in our day, and there's a reason for that. God uses the church. Here's how he uses us. God displays his holiness and his righteousness and the fact that he knows everything and that God has a plan and he's working through everything through people who are not as holy as he is, as righteous. That's really even an understatement to say as, right? We are way off the mark. (laughs) We don't know what he knows. We don't see what he sees. But what we do is we look back and we recognize that God has been with us. He He has put up with us. He has reached out to us. God reveals things about himself to us that we need to know. It's not everything, right? I mean, short, far short of everything, but he does it so that people will see who he is in the midst of a messed up church, yes. (laughs) And we're trying to find our place in the midst of this messed up thing called church. I hope that you are. I'm still trying to find my place, and uh, I know that uh, I come from a tradition of the minister, the person who said it's supposed to be holy and righteous above and never, you know, and and the, the old tradition was Uh, ministers never let you see that side of them, the human side of them. In fact, they always kept a big, big, big distance from the people, even in their congregation, so that you wouldn't realize, hey, he's just as messed up as I am. Yes. (laughs) And following the same God that hopefully you are following and trying to be close to, knowing that he knows the way, he knows what he's doing, he's the one that has the plan, he's the one that fixes it, so we look to him in this way. Does that make sense? In fact, it's one of my, the things I've always loved to say. I have some staff members that will remind me of this. I'll, I'll say it again. I always love to say this. Listen, I know that you're looking for the perfect church. I know that you're looking for the church that, know, that does everything the way you think it should be done because that would make it perfect, right? So, it, and, and probably you come in with a list of things. I'm looking for, so I understand. So let me just give you some quick advice, real simple, but it, you should take this to heart. If you find the perfect church, please, please, please do not join it. You will mess it up. So just <laughs> don't do it, right? 
leave it perfect, walk away and say, I found it, and I don't want to mess it up, so I'm going someplace else instead. I have a good, I have a good friend, so he's moved to another state, and he uh, loved this church uh, that he saw from a distance, and some of his family's there, and man, he would just rave about it over and over and over and over again. You know, it's just they do everything right, and they're so perfect. Now, now he's moved there. He's become a part of that church. So now when I talk to him, all he tells me about is the things they're not doing right. And they do this, and they're messed up. And, they, and I'm like, okay, yeah, that's the way it is. When you get close and you get in it, you know, you're going to find out that we are all the same. We're struggling. And in our struggle, uh, hopefully God is lifted up as a song. Wasn't that a great song that Mikey wrote? Yeah. Even now, in the midst of all of our struggles, we, we worship a God who understands it, who's figured it out. He has a plan. He's going to take us forward um, in that plan. So it was the same way with the Corinthians, same way with Paul dealing with them. In fact, I'll remind you at this point in the letter, Paul has already been dealing with questions that they've been asking him. And all of the questions had to do with things they could not figure out. It shouldn't be this way. Why is it this way? Can you fix this? I was listening to a guy that I do listen to often because he's a really good historian uh, digging into the Bible and all, but he said this uh, when he was dealing with, with uh, this chapter. He said, so the Corinthians, their struggles and all, you know, they had their struggles, but the struggles we have are totally different. They didn't have any of those struggles. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? <laughs> have, have, have you completely lost it in saying something like that? Because you listen to the questions and you're like, well, yeah, these are the same questions. Now, does it work out the same way? No, not necessarily, because they're also dealing with their questions in the midst of their culture. And you have to understand, and it's good to understand, 2,000 years ago, the Greco-Roman culture was not the Western culture of the United States. So they did things differently, but it was still the same struggles that they had. They had these struggles with men and women. It's a good thing we don't have those anymore, right? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's, this guy said, you know, uh, we have um, women lib issues. We have, you know, women's roles issues. They didn't have them. I'm like, are you reading the same Bible I'm reading? Of course they had them. This is absolutely nothing new. And that's why they brought it up. How do we deal with this? They, one of the phrases that you see over and over in 1 Corinthians is Paul brings up this phrase. They say, but I am free to do anything what? I want to do. I'm free to do whatever. I want. He uses it over and over again because this is one of their favorite sayings. And it was also probably a part of their new Christianity, their relationship with Christ. They found this freedom in this relationship. Therefore, I'm free to do anything I want. It's a struggle of all of us. We're always struggling through this. Yes, but as he says, but not everything is profitable. Not everything is the way that you should do it. You do have freedom, but you're trying to figure out how should I act? How should I live? How is, is this going to work? Because this has to work, and this is usually pretty messed up. So we're still always trying to figure out how to make it work. I know that uh, not everybody likes my chihuahua stories, but I decided I'd tell you one of my chihuahua illustrations. Okay, a lot of people liked them. I understand. So Teddy is my little two and a half pound terrorist. Um, he was a rescue dog and he is pretty messed up, just to let you know. And uh, not that I'm messed up, but he's messed up. And so one of the things that happens on Friday mornings is that we strip the bed at about seven o'clock in the morning. We strip the bed all of the sheets, pillowcases, we have a duvet, so there's a duvet cover that buttons on, and the buttons don't ever want to come unbuttoned, and so it's part of a struggle that my wife lets me go through, for the most part, to strip the bed, but Teddy, in the morning, after he gets up, he goes outside, he eats, he wants to get up in that bed, because uh, he likes being in that bed, and so when I go to strip the bed at 7 o'clock, guess who's in it? And what do you think he's doing? He's defending his territory. Because I'm tearing up the bed in his, in his mind. And so he, a two and a half pound little all teeth thing, is diving at me, trying to bite me as I reach for something. He's biting at the hand, so I try to fake him and then button it. I mean, it's just, and I'm sitting there going, this is messed up. <laughs> I, I own this bed. <laughs> I bought this bed. I'm the one that has to take care of taking the sheets off and putting them in the washer. That's my only job in the morning. But still, I'm the one that has to do this. 
and you're biting me and trying to stop me because you get to take advantage of the bed. You get to stay here and you don't do anything. And so I tell him all the time, I go, you don't wash things, you don't clean. He just makes messes. Yes, that's what Teddy does. It's pretty messed up, isn't it? Don't you think God looks at us a little bit that way? After all I've done, <laughs> right? After how much I've loved you, cared for you, provided for you, given you, you know, and you just mess it up. We do, because just like Teddy, we don't get it sometimes, you know. We get hung up in how we see it, how we want it, you know, what, what, what suits our needs or how, what we think are our needs. And, and it's just difficult for us to, to deal with sometimes. So Paul's dealing with exactly the same thing um, in, in their life. So here's what I'm going to do. This is because my wife told me to do this. And uh, just let you know, I do listen to her. And um, that doesn't mean I do what she says. But this, in this case, I am. She said, just read the passage. So I'm going to read the passage to you. And if you want to uh, highlight some things, underline some things, I'll come back to some of those things uh, as, I, as I do this. But I'm just going to read straight through it because I want you to catch um, what Paul says. And hopefully, I won't stop too much and interrupt myself as I'm doing it. Here we go. This is beginning with verse number two because most of the uh, scholars think verse number one would have belonged in, in the previous chapter. But here's what he says. He says, I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts. This is Paul speaking to them. And that you're following the teaching I passed on to you. Many translations will use, I know I'm commenting already, many translations will use the traditions. We'll get to that in just, in just a minute. He says, but there's one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. And they would pray when the group would gather. It's not like these gatherings, but they would gather together. They would pray together. And sometimes people would prophesy, which would mean they, were, they would talk about the revelations of God as he has disclosed them uh, to us. They didn't have a New Testament. It wasn't written. Uh, they had some Old Testament scrolls, but they're having to work on a whole lot less than we have. And so they're talking about those and proclaiming uh, those to one another in their gathering. He says, but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies, same things that the man did, prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. We'll get to that in just a minute. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all of her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. Verse 7, a man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping. For man is made in, the, in God's image and reflects God's glory. And woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made from woman, or made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. Listen to this in verse number 11. There's some of my highlights in here too. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, Men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from who? Yeah, a woman, okay. For everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it is disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue with this, I like what Paul does this, because this is what I'm saying. If anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do all the, uh, the God's other churches. So he's just kind of laying it out there and saying, hey, listen, this is the way we do it. Now, let, me, let me give you some, some context of this also. In their culture, in Corinth, in the um, Roman Greco type of culture, that there was a, a difference in how they operated. When they gathered together, for the most part, 
Even when they gathered together, the women were on one side and the men were on the other side. They did not gather as couples. That's just not their culture. That was just not how they did it. It would have, it would have been strange for them to do it that way. So the women you know, were not necessarily matched up with men. And in their culture, one of the ways that a woman showed that she had a husband who watched after her, protected her, cared for her, was that when she would come in a gathering like that, she would have a head covering. It was reflective of the fact that women have long hair, yes. And uh, as I like to tell the guys, and you can just look around the room if you want to do this also, women have long hair, and for the most part, they keep it. I won't say anything, guys, about what happens to guys, right? For the most part, it doesn't work that way in men. And with women, it is a beautiful thing. It is a, it, you know, it's one of those things that you look at and go, wow, why couldn't I have hair like that? Or, you know, Brad Pitt has it. But besides Brad Pitt, you know, why couldn't I have hair like that? But it, it's part of her glory. And in one sense, he says, and she is the glory of a man. That's, that's, I, I think that's true, absolutely. I, I you know, I may be a little different, but I, when I look at men, I go, okay, you know. But when I look at women, I go, oh, yeah. I mean, I like women. I just tell you. I like my wife. I think she is gorgeous. I think, you know, and I, and, and I think it's kind of built that way, don't you? Don't you think we're kind of built that way? So, so that I would say she has something, she is something that I do not have and that I am not. We are different, and yet we are compatible. We are. Even when he says that the woman was made for the man, not the man for the woman. That he's talking about going back into creation. And the woman was made because the man needed someone. It, God said, it's not good for the man to be by himself. And so he made someone, and the word that's used there, who was a suitable, I means she matches up well with him, suitable helper for him. It's not a derogatory term. It's not a subordinate term. In this case, the idea of being a helper means that she is the perfect match for what he lacks, for, for his need in life. And he is incomplete without her. If you're a person and you say, but, I, but I'm not married, it doesn't mean that you are incomplete. You are complete because of who Christ is and because God made you. But as far as humans are concerned and the, the continuance of the species, right, they were made to need one another. You can't have more kids without one and the other. They have to come together uh, to make this work. I had somebody uh, tell me, show me about three months ago, they said, have you seen this uh, new video out there and they're proclaiming and celebrating um, these men who are pregnant? And I said, yes. And being from a scientific background and a medical background, I said, let me explain. They're not, they're not women <laughs> and they're, I mean, they're, they're men and they're not women, uh, but they are women. Because if they weren't women, they could not have babies. They don't have the equipment if they are a man. They may feel like a man. They may want to be a man, but they have to be female to have the equipment to have a baby. It's just how God made us. And I always like it because a lot of the uh, professors and those who are in the field have made the same statements I just made to you and have now been banned from speaking because you're not allowed to say that in the culture. But it's just, it's true. This is who God made us. And we are the ones who struggle with accepting who we are and how God made us. And then he made us one for the other. Um, you don't know this, but uh, Garrett, who uh, works with the uh, youth and all too, and Garrett's right over here. Garrett, stand up, wave. Garrett's hair was a lot longer a couple of days ago. I mean, Garrett had the, the, the coolest looking locks and curls and, you know, whatever. It just reminded me of one of those, those old movies, you know, that, of, a, of a guy back, you know, three or 400 years ago when they, their hair was a lot longer. And so he made, a, he made a, an agreement with uh, the students, and uh, they won their agreement, and they got to cut off his hair. And, Garrett, thank you for uh, doing that. And his... Uh, <laughs> He did not do it because of these verses. <laughs> our culture is not the same. Men will have in our culture what you might consider long hair. Of course, it's always, so what length are you talking about, right? 
And women will have shorter hair in our culture. It is not a disgrace to them in our culture. In their culture, it was. And in their culture, one of the struggles that they had in, as they would gather together is sometimes women would come in, they might have had short hair, maybe because of their background before they became believers, maybe because of what they did before, they would come in and in the gathering, they would cover their head and there were some objections to it. They shouldn't be covering their head. They're not married or they're not you know, protected by a benefactor and that is showing the, no, absolutely, Paul is saying, is it right for them then to come in and to pray or to share something about who God is without covering their head? No, it is not right because of who God himself is. And that's what he's getting to. They didn't obey just the culture around them. There was also a reason that they did the things that they did. So I told you that they were separated. So sometimes in their separation, even the women would say, I don't understand something. They would speak sometimes across to the men, maybe to their husband or someone asking a question. And Paul is later going to say this. He says, you know what? You should hold that until you get home to deal with that and not interrupt the meeting. These are all things that Paul is trying to deal with in their culture, in keeping some sort of order, in, in, in making this work so that we can work together and grow together. And there will always be, even here with us, even here, there will always be some sense of you having to surrender maybe what you think is your right, you know, in order to keep order and to show respect for other people and to make it work. Of course there is. Always works that way. I don't know if you saw the... Uh, Tennis, the U.S. Open this weekend, uh, but in the semifinals, uh, Coco Groff, who eventually won the, U, uh, the women's side, 19-year-old, amazing. In her semifinal match, there were protesters there. So in the big, I think it's, they were in the Arthur Ashe Stadium, if you go way up to the top, the cheap seats, right? And in the cheap seats, there was a section of a, a, a group of, of people who were protesting, I think, environmental issues. And so, you know, they thought, okay, how do you do this? Interrupt the whole thing, interrupt TV, which we want this, this platform for our message. And so one of the protesters, did you see it? They reported on it later. He decided to what? He decided to glue his feet to the stadium floor. Yes. Not his shoes, his feet. Because if you take super glue, and you, you can glue your feet to almost anything. He glued his feet to the stadium floor and the New York police who are known to be courteous and careful and very kind, but because they're on television and they, and they know, uh, and, and it's funny because I laugh. Uh, so you know what they did to, to, to they cut off his feet? No, they didn't cut off his feet, so. <laughs> this is nothing new to them. They've done this before. They brought in a big gallon of acetone and poured it on the floor and eventually dissolve the glue and remove the protester. There's always protests going on. There's always somebody that doesn't like something. But Paul is just talking about in, in, in the group, you, you might be offended by something. It's okay. But in the group, there's a sense of unity that we have to have to make it work. Listen, they had, they had divisions. He's already talked about those. They had struggles with their sexual morality that caused problems, yes. They had, they had problems with suing one another, absolutely. They had problems with their socioeconomic status, treating one person in one group different than the other, absolutely. All of these things are very real. In fact, there's more to come in his letter to the Corinthians, other issues that they would struggle with, including the, the most fun that's coming up in a couple weeks, their struggle with understanding what love really meant and what love really was. Yes, what a wonderful thing that we would struggle with those. And because we struggle with those, we would have to dig in again and say, what does it really mean? What is he trying to say? What is he trying to teach us? And how does it apply? This is the, the, the pastor who taught me and raised me. This is what he would always say. And how does it apply to us? He said, after the end of every sermon, you should ask this one question. So what? <laughs> Why does that matter? Because if you can't get to that, you didn't go far enough. You didn't dig deep enough. Because God, even though this is something that Paul writes and God does 2,000 years ago, 
There are things there for us to learn and for us to understand that would apply to us and our relationship with God and what it means to be a messed up church, but used by God in a really messed up world that needs him and uh, and his son as their savior. So here's the backside of this outline. If you want to turn and look at this, I, I, I do like to print this outline for you. So you'll have something to go home with. And uh, this part comes from the, uh, um, uh, the Bible knowledge commentary. Yeah. Um, and, and this is just the commentary written by many professors. This is what they put together on this one word. I thought I'd focus on this one word because we can't cover everything in here uh, just for you this morning. Here's what it says. He says, the word head, and this word in the Greek is kephale. So the word kephale seems to express two things, subordination and origination. So that would mean, you know, the head would say, the head is over the body, so it's subordination. And then an origination is the idea that, um, the, that all this came from the head. And those are two different uh, concepts of there. In fact, he explains these. He goes uh, on to say the former uh, reflects the more usual Old Testament usage, the latter that of the Greek vernacular. And vernacular just means the custom or the way that they would think about it and uh, how they would work it out. Um, the former is primarily in this passage, but the latter may also be found. The subordination of Christ to God is noted elsewhere in the letter. His subordination to the Father is also true of his work as the agent of creation. So just as, um, I think, I, did I explain that, that God is also our helper? And he's described as our helper, just like the wife is described as the helper of the man. Same word, same usage. So it doesn't mean that God is less than us. It just means that God meets our needs, the needs that we can't meet ourselves. So we are helpers of one another. We were made gifted in a way that we can supply what someone else does not have in their life uh, also. So there's this idea always of at times in your life, you will be subordinate to someone else. Always. You go to the restaurant today, and you may not like this, but there will be someone who walks up, they are a waiter or a waitress, and they get to call the shots. You get to order, <laughs> but they get to call the shots. And my wife got on to me about three or four weeks ago. We had flown in. It was like, uh, left at like four in the morning, flew from another part of the country. I was tired. We decided to go to breakfast with my son. I did not want to go. I'd already been up like seven or eight hours. We went anyway. And she got on to me. She said, you were rude to that waitress. <laughs> you seemed short and perturbed. And, and I had to say, you're right. I was. I was. I mean, there's no doubt. I was. And she called me down for it. She said, that's not right. I said, you're right. It's not right. And I said, did you notice afterwards how overly nice I was to her? Because I realized I was wrong. I shouldn't have been that short. and that Because she's the one running the show. Without her, I don't get anything to eat. You know, it's just the, it's the way it works. It, when you leave here, there will probably be an officer when you leave on the street. You may think you're smarter than the officer. You may think you're more educated than the officer. You may think you have more money than the officer. They'll get on to me with this one. You may think you're better looking than the officer. You will be subordinate to the officer, right? <laughs> and if you decide not to be, you will cause issues and trouble and struggles and put them in a difficult position of having to exercise authority in order to do what? To maintain control and order and to make it work. This is life. This is just the way it works. But there's one part that's missing in this. I was reading some other historians, and I thought this was really important to, because uh, I, I think what they write is good, but there's another part in this, and I think that you have to make sure that you don't miss the relational part of this also. In fact, the covering of the head for the woman demonstrated that she was also under protection. So you didn't mess with her, because she had a covering on her head. And the covering on her head, even though she was there with other women, said, I have a husband that if you mess with me, you're going to have to mess with him. Or I have a father that if you mess with me, you'll have to mess with him. There's someone looking after me and protecting me, and that covering represented the fact that there was someone in life who looked after. In their culture, it was necessary. 
A woman who had no protector was very vulnerable. She could be taken advantage of. She could be abused. And so it was important for her to show that she had that. And like I said, some of the women that were there might have been single and still had a covering on their head. Why do you think they would cover their head? Because they're saying, I do have a protector. I do have someone who watches after me. And it was Christ himself who is described as the head of the man. He's above the man. So that is the covering for her that she is still expressing in the worship service. And the man would not wear a hat in order to point to the one who is covering him, Christ himself. I know you're saying, how does that, I don't know. I'm just telling you that's what they did. That was their culture um, at the time. When we were in uh, Israel in April, some people here were there also, it was a lot of fun because the guy that was our guide um, who was Jewish and he would remind us when we would go into churches in the area, there in the, in the area of Israel and Palestine, he would say, when you go into this church, men, take your hat off, because if you don't, you will offend them. You know, it may not offend you. You may think, well, that doesn't make any sense to me, but you do it so that you don't offend their customs, and we would always be reminded, take your hat off as you would go in. Here's what's always funny, and I would ask him about this. We go into Jewish settings, in fact, we would go down to the Wailing Wall. And if you go down to the Wailing Wall there in Jerusalem, it's divided. There is a barrier there, a pretty significant barrier. You can't get over it or around it. And the women are on one side and the men are on the other. They still hold to that tradition that they had way back then. And the women will not cover their head. They are not to cover their head in Jewish tradition. And in the men, they will wear hats. And so when you go into that area, you are reminded, oop, take your hat. You have to cover your head or you will offend. So we ask our God, so why is it that the Jewish tradition is the man wears the hat? In the Christian tra tradition in this area, the man does not have the hat. His response was, I think whatever one group does, the other does the opposite. That's all he knew how to do. So I, you know, and I, <laughs> listen, I think that was a pretty good explanation. Maybe it was. But he wanted to make sure that we understood, don't offend either group. It's not worth it. We don't want to get into this. Don't try to start a new tradition. Don't try, you know, just recognize that this is the way it is and go in and deal with it in that way. Yeah. We have our culture. We have our traditions. We have the ways that we see it. The ways that we try to worship God and honor God um, in the way that we deal with one another. And, and to not deal with one another, to not show compassion to one another, and not understand that not everyone sees it the same. Listen, that would not honor God, because God is the one who is our covering, and he is the one that protects us, and he is the one who leads us, and he, he guides us in life. I'll give you two passages real quickly, because these are all writ also written by uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, they're also considered to be the Word of God. Um, in the Bible also. Here's what he writes in Romans chapter uh, number 12. He says, but our bodies have many parts, yes? And he's using a metaphor of the body. And incidentally, all this other stuff is metaphorical also. The covering was metaphorical. It didn't mean that the covering itself protected them. It was a symbol of who watched after them and protected them. But our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. Yeah, it was his decision. How strange a body would be if it had only one part, right? You ever seen any bodies that's just a hand? No. <laughs> it would be pretty strange to think that it would work that way. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Because the feet are nothing without the head, the head's nothing without the feet, right? They, they have to be connected. They have to work together. In fact, this is what he says in verse 22. Some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important, catch this, you better hold on to this, are actually the most necessary. He means the, the most Im important. He says, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. While the um, more honorable parts, that means presentable parts, the parts that you look at, do not require this special care. So God has put the body together in such an extra 
uh, in, uh, together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. That just means less to look at. Um, in verse 25, he says, this makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, guess what? <laughs> all the parts are honored, yes. And that's the way it works for us. Incidentally, next chapter is gonna talk a lot about this as he gets into gifting. And uh, we don't all have the same gifts, not all the same abilities, but God has chosen and how we deal with that. In verse 28, I'm sorry, in Galatians 3.28, he says this. There's no longer, listen to this, this is really good. There's no longer Jew or Gentile. Because in their world, there was. Oh, no, you don't, I, I understand. But with God, with Christ, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. In their world, yes. There's no longer male or female. In the world we live in, yes. But we understand something different about how God sees us and who we are to him. And so he says, for you are all one in Christ. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. Not that you're of Jewish descent. You're the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to who? That's something that God has done for you, for me. That those promises that we were not a part of that people but we have inherited those promises because of what Christ himself has done. So I gave you three applications really quick. I won't take any time on this, but I just thought as best you can, here's what you should do. As best you can, you and I, men and women, we should step up. And I say this because I was listening to a guy, a young guy. He was really nervous doing this. You can tell I'm not nervous at all. Okay, he, you know, he was really nervous uh, teaching on this. And so he did what a lot of guys do when they're at the end of it all. They say, men, we need to step up. You men, you need to, he just, he's chastising all the men in the room. You need to step up. So let me just go ahead and add, men and women, we need to step up. It's not just men, it's not just women. We have to take on our role and say, this is who God has made me. And the question is then, how should I live? What should I do? Because God has given me a, a role and things that I can do that other people cannot do. So if I don't do my part, then that part is missing in all of this. Second is trust God and what he has done for us because that's the strength of who we are is the one who has united us together, who has a role for us, who, who is bigger than we are and who puts it all together to make it work out into something really wonderful. And then the last thing is, and he's gonna talk about this in a couple of weeks, uh, use your gift. Um, don't bail out because of someone else's gift. And if you wanna correct the English in there, it was really bad. There's an S that shouldn't be there, an apostrophe that's missing. So don't bail out because of someone, their gift also, what, what God has gifted. Don't think, well, since I don't have their gift, I'm not cooperating. Since I'm not like them, I'm not doing I would like what they have. I want to be, the, don't do that. You look at your life and you thank God for your life and what he's made you and what he's given you. And say, God, how would you want to use me? You know, Because this is a unique opportunity. You made me the way I am. You gave me the things that I have. My, my role, my part to play is vital to the function, there's the metaphor again, to the function of the body. Whether it is a seen part, or whether it is a special part, an unseen part, which you, you know like I do, the unseen parts are even more vital to our lives. I have a neighbor, he, uh, he is a doctor who works in the gastro system, right? And so he showed me one time, I'd been to his office. He said, would you like to see what your inside digestive system looks like? And I did not hesitate. I said, no. <laughs> I don't want to see what it looks like. I, that would be gross. You know, I, what are you talking about? I just want you to tell me it's working okay and to tell me how to fix it if it's not. I know the parts I want to see. I'll work on those parts. But that part I know is vital to who I am. But I'm trusting that you know how to fix it. And you know what I should do to make it work. And uh, we do the same thing with God. Let's pray together. And Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you understand us. You know us. Uh, sometimes the things that we think are so difficult to deal with really are even more important for us to address. 
and to be reminded of all the good things that you've done for us, that you have plans that are way beyond our plans and our understanding. And uh, your faithfulness, your faithfulness is what we put our hope in and our trust in. Um, Even though we go through struggles and difficulties, and even in the midst of all those things, the hurts, the pains, sometimes the questions that we don't know how to answer, Lord, what a wonderful thing that we have to know that you do have answers and we can look to you. We can pray to you, not that you will tell us everything we want to know or everything we ask, but it reminds us of how faithful you are to us. If you're here and you've never followed, never trusted Jesus Christ, maybe it's just one of those things you just thought, I just need to do it myself. I just need to fix my own life. And it's certainly not that you and I don't have a part to play in that, but how are we going to fix it if we don't talk to the one who made us? The one who has even a better idea, even better dreams of who we could be than we have. Our rescuer, our savior, the one who is our protector, our designer and the one who is our great lover. So if you've never done that, what a wonderful time to say, Lord, I I don't know what to do, but I believe that you gave me life. I believe that this is my time. I believe your son Jesus Christ came to rescue me from being lost and not knowing what to do and how to live. I believe that he will be my guide. Forgive me my sins. Give me your spirit, a new spirit to live inside of me, to teach me. In Jesus' name I pray.